going to be continuing our series in the I Am's of Jesus. We're, we're on our penultimate week. Uh, next week, we, we finish the series and then we move on to the Psalms where we sovereignly, God has planned that we get to, to sing and, and rejoice and praise him as we look through uh, the, the last five Psalms. And so that's going to be really exciting for us. Uh, but let's dive into this passage today. I've been just so blessed by the fact that we, we get to see who Jesus is. Uh, we get to, to see him reveal himself to us uh, so that we can know, so as we can be transformed, uh, so as we can be equipped uh, to be able to go out into the, all of the earth uh, and to proclaim him and the excellencies of his name. Uh, why don't I just pray for us as we kind of prepare our hearts just to receive his word. Father God, would you speak to us today? We thank you so much that you have revealed yourself to us through your son, Jesus Christ, and that the words in our Bibles are able to reveal more of you to us, for it is your word. Lord, by your spirit to, to know you, to be transformed by you, and to be led into obedience because of who you are and what you've done. And I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Several years ago, Joe and I, we went to a wedding in the countryside of Lancashire. I had never been to Lancashire before. It was a beautiful place. The wall-to-wall blue skies, the sun was shining, a wedding of close friends. Joe was a bridesmaid. I was speaking at the wedding, so we were all suited and booted. We looked great. And we got to enjoy that, that celebration together. We got to enjoy uh, the festivities in a, a local parish church in the middle of nowhere, and right in the countryside, a little small building, it's much smaller than this. And then afterwards, we got to go and celebrate at the reception in the local village hall. And it was amazing, the the festivities, the food, the dancing, the the, the catching up with friends, the enjoying one another's company. Uh, And we we were there late to the night. Uh, We didn't have kids at the time, so we didn't have to worry about that. But we did live up in Newcastle-upon-Tyne, and so that's still quite a distance to travel. Uh, But we were young, we were uh, carefree, so we, we waited until almost the last, the last moments of the evening, while everyone else was starting to clear up, we got in the car ready to go home. And we, we got in the car and our, our phones had, this was back a few years ago, so our charge on our phones was rubbish. And so having taken a lot of photos during the day and videos, we had no phones. Now, that was a silly idea because that was our sat-nav. And so we had no sat-nav for the way home. And so basically, I'm sitting in the car, I'm driving out the entrance of this village hall, and I turn the car into these dark country roads. And deep down, I'm going, I have no idea where I'm going. I have no idea how to get home. I knew vaguely that I had to get to the motorway. I had no idea where the motorway was. There was no signs, there was no streetlights, there was no people. Um, It was best guess scenario. And I kept it secret. Joe didn't have a clue at that stage. As most guys, as they're driving, will know, we we don't let anyone into the fact that we have no idea where we're going. And I was starting to get a little bit anxious within myself, starting to fear the worst, that we were never getting home tonight. Uh, We were going to be stranded in the middle of the countryside, down a dark country lane, and have no clue where we were. Uh, No clue if we would ever be rescued. And Joe started to pick up on this. She started to, to pick up on, Chris, you have no idea where you're going. Uh, and being the, the great wife that she is, she always carries an AA roadmap in the back of the car. And so she made me stop the car in a lay-by. We got the map out, and we're trying to find, and like, it's dark. We've got the little light inside the front of the car just to, to guide us. And Joe, I don't know how she's trying to do this, but she's trying to pinpoint what C road that we're on using this AA roadmap so as we could try to work out how to get to the motorway. I had given up hope. There was no way in this earth that uh, AA roadmap and Joe, even with her jug of experience, and I don't know what she was doing, looking at the stars, trying to work out where she was going, where we were, trying to pinpoint it all. I had lost hope that we were ever going to find our way home. And by God's grace, a car came down that country lane. Now, we have no idea whether that car was from the wedding or who that car was or who was in it or whether, even where they were going, but we decided that they were our best bet home. And so we followed them, and sure enough, they, they went via a motorway. So we got onto a motorway. We were able to travel home with a deep sigh of relief, probably about half an hour later than anticipated. But the, the, the fear and the, the trouble that I was feeling in my heart because I couldn't work out my way home. 
Uh, the, the same is true, I think, whenever we are away from home and we kind of have a longing to be back at home. Have you ever been on holiday, maybe a 10-day holiday or a fortnight holiday, and you're like enjoying the sun, you're enjoying the, the, the sea, the food, the rest, you've read your five books that you've been meeting to read all year, and you kind of get to day seven, and you're kind of like, do you know what? I'm, I quite happily go home now. I've, I've, I've enjoyed everything. I can still enjoy myself, but do you know what? I, I quite fancy my bed. I quite fancy my, my, my own sofa where I can just sit and, and lounge back. For me, this is, this is a weird one. I, I quite enjoy the tap water that comes from my kitchen. Uh, compared to everywhere else, I long to be home to get a glass of my tap water. It's a weird quirk of mine, I'm sorry. Uh, don't judge me. But there's a deep longing for home, and we, we all have it. We always have, and we always will. We will continue to have that, that longing to, to be home, to have that quality rest, to have that quality security. And I'm not talking whenever I say home, just simply your house. I'm not talking about the place necessarily that you currently live. It's, it's that, that comfort, that place that you know peace and security and safety and contentment and rest. That is the home that we kind of all long for. And as we look to John 14, some things that we need to, to note, this happens on the eve of Jesus' crucifixion. And so Jesus and his disciples have just enjoyed their last supper together in chapter 13. Unknown to them, it was their last supper, but Jesus has been talking about leaving uh, throughout all of his recent conversations. We've got Judas, one of the disciples, has just been outed in the middle of that meal, and he has gone and left the room with the disciples, and he has gone to, to the authorities in order to hand Jesus over. And, and as I said, throughout all of this, Jesus is continually talking about leaving the disciples. Now, these are guys that have invested three years of their life with Jesus. They've followed him. They've given everything up for the sake of following Jesus. And there's a sense of their anxiety and their devastation kind of filling their hearts. Uh, We've got Simon Peter going, no, wherever you go, I'll go. If you lay down your life, I'll lay down my life. And then Jesus kind of speaks to Simon Peter and says, no, before I even die, before I go away, you will deny even knowing me three times. And so there's a real heart of devastation. Jesus, a few verses later in verse 18, actually calls the disciples that they'll be like orphans because they are losing what is almost like a parent to them. They are children and they're losing their parents and they will, have, they will feel as though they have nothing. They have no one and they have given up everything. And Jesus and his disciples in this moment are, are walking towards the Garden of Gethsemane, where Jesus is about to pray. He's about to sweat drops of blood because he is in agony thinking about where he is going and what he is about to do, taking on the cross and taking on upon himself all of the sin and the darkness and the shame that, that we deserve and going through the agony of that. And so he stands and as he walks in the midst of feeling that, that agony within his own heart, it's at that point that he speaks to his disciples and he says, let not your hearts be troubled. Believe in God. Believe also in me. In my father's house, there are many rooms. If it were not so, would I have told you that I go to prepare a place for you? And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and will take you to myself, that where I am, you may be also. Jesus says, let not your hearts be troubled. Don't be afraid. Trust in God and trust in me. In the midst of your pain, in the midst of your fears, in the midst of all of your anxieties, in your unbelief, if in your unknowingness of what's about to happen, trust in me. What I find absolutely striking about this is Jesus doesn't give 10 reasons why they should trust in him. He doesn't go, well, look, remember the bread that I broke and it fed 5,000 people. Remember the time I walked on water. Remember the time I turned water into wine. Remember the time that guy who was blind, remember he could see? He doesn't, give, he doesn't list a whole lot of reasons for why they should trust in him. Instead, he points to his mission 
and to his purpose. He is going to leave. He's going to go. And he's going to prepare. For in my Father's house are many rooms. And we're talking about heaven here. We're talking about the, uh, the, the, the heaven with God the Father. Some translations use the term mansions. Uh, but Jesus isn't here explaining the characteristics of the Father's house. Instead, he is emphasizing that the Father's house has many rooms. An abundance of space for all who believe in him. And so, whenever we are thinking about this, we have to think not about what, those, what that place would be like, but what that place is for. Now, later in the Bible, Jesus is described as a bridegroom who goes off to prepare a home for his bride. And he will return and bring his bride into that new home to be with him. And so, Cornerstone, we need to remember that that we are citizens of a different place, that we are sojourners, we are exiles, we are refugees in this place here and now. And in fact, we have a home. We have a place that has been prepared for us. And so we wait in eager expectation, looking forward to that new home, a place that is fulfilled hope, a place of eternal joy, of eternal peace, where there is no more sadness, where there is no more tears, where there is complete satisfaction, because we will be in the presence of the Father. This idea of of troubled hearts, it's something that is expressed uh, within all of culture and society nowadays. Um, There's a constant angst that we feel within ourselves. There's There's something else to life. There must be more than this is a question that that people ask in in different shapes and forms. The reality is God said back in Ecclesiastes 3 verse 11 that God has put within our hearts eternity. We, We know about eternity. Even if we try to suppress that truth, even though we try to hide it and deny it, God has put eternity on our hearts. And so that question of there must be more to life than this is because of that reality. And so we know Like, we know there is more to life than this. And we go searching for it. And we might go in different directions to try to find it. And we get lost. And and often, uh, the the angst that I felt while driving my car trying to find home, that's just a pale reflection of the angst within our hearts that we, we feel on a daily basis when we do not know the way home. And so the medicine for a troubled heart is not an instantaneous fix. It's not a just believe in these five ways, but it's, it's knowing, it's trusting, it's having a sure and certain hope that, that Jesus has gone and prepared a place for us. It's having that certain hope that we have a place in his Father's house, a place that we can call home, a place that is our true home, that is prepared, a place of no more tears, of sadness, or a place of joy, a place of contentment, a place of abundance of life as we are able to rest in the abiding presence of God the Father. And so that's what Jesus does. He reveals that truth to them as he walks along the way, as they seek to to deal with their troubled hearts. He tells them that they have a home. As they walk unknowingly into the darkness of Good Friday, their hearts are restored. Their troubled hearts are won over by the good news that Jesus will return. He's leaving but he will return and he will take them with him to be in the place that he is going to be, their true eternal home. And so they know the way. And as they walk along, they, Thomas starts to ask some questions. Now, I think Thomas gets a bad rap. Uh, Thomas, doubting Thomas. Thomas, the guy who always asks questions. Thomas, the guy who's really blunt with those questions. I think he gets a bad rap because really, I think that we are more like Thomas than anyone else. How often we are asking, oh, I don't understand what Jesus is on about. How often we ask, could you, could you explain this a bit more? I'm not sure. Um, say it plainly. Essentially, all of the things that Thomas asks over the, the, the passages in the Bible, we often are asking ourselves. And, and really, he's asking what all of the disciples are thinking. We do not know where you're going. How can we know the way? And Jesus explains to us with that key verse, I am the way. I am the truth 
I am the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. I am the way. I am the way home. There is no other way. And the home that that Jesus is talking about, the, the place that he is preparing, that preparation work is needed because to get home currently in that moment needed work. It was a giant insurmountable chasm for us to be able to get home. We couldn't do it ourselves because mankind is separated from God. Mankind is, is separated from God. That is, the, that is ultimately the angst that we feel in our lives because we were meant to be in relationship with God. But the sin in our lives has broken that apart. And so our hearts are, are devoid of, of, of God. Our lives are devoid of God because of that separation of sin and rebellion against him. And so what we do is we try our best to fill that void with the good things that we can do, with, with other things, with other directions, as we seek to fill that void. But ultimately, that void is impossible for man. It is impossible for man to get to that place, that true home that Jesus has been talking about. And so, for mankind, we remain eternally separated from God. And so the big question of life is, how do we solve that problem? How do we solve that problem? And Thomas puts it another way, how do we know the way to go? And Jesus simply says, I am the way. And in the next three days, he's going to prove that he's the way because he's going to wipe away every obstacle that is in that way. Our sin and death, all of that will be removed for he took upon himself our sin. He died in our place, taking the punishment that that we deserve. He died so that we could live. He laid down his life for us. He bridged the chasm that was there, that separation that was there, so that we can walk into that eternal presence of God the Father through him and him alone. So let not your hearts be troubled. Believe in God Believe also in me. I am the way. And when Jesus says that he's the way, he was saying that there is no other way. And and that's the truth that he's talking about. He is the truth. He is the absolute truth. Peter, who denies him before his death, denies even knowing him. Later in Acts 4, he is giving a defense to authorities. And what he says in verse 12 is, There is salvation in no one else, for there is no other name under heaven given among men by which we must be saved. Only by the name of Jesus can we be saved. That's the truth that people don't like to hear. As I speak the the gospel to my friends, they, they say, Chris, come on. I don't want to hear that. Let's talk about something else. I don't want to hear that. And I'm like, No, that is the most important thing for you to hear. When souls are at stake, we need to tell people the truth. For Micah, my two-year-old, if he was to run across the road in front of oncoming traffic, and he does this quite a lot at the minute, what we do is we don't just go, Micah, don't do that. We're not kind and gentle and weak and kind of all lovely. What we do is we, out of all of the breath that is in our lungs, we go, no, stop come back. We shout, we grab him by the scruff of his neck, by his foot, by his arm, whatever we possibly can to save him from that oncoming car. If I go home tonight and see that my neighbor's house is on fire and she's asleep and can't hear the smoke alarms, I am going to try my best to kick down that door. I'm going to run up those stairs and I'm going to drag her out of that bed and I'm going to take her out into safety. Now, in other circumstances, that might be seen as illegal. But in that circumstance, that is the most loving thing I can do to save that person's soul, to save that person physically. And so I will do whatever it takes to do that. The reality is the most unloving thing that we can do as Christians is to hide that truth from people, to to not share that truth, to, to point people in the wrong direction by not revealing that truth to them. And I know that we all know this because I see heads nodding in agreement. 
But yet so often we are like Peter, as he was just before Jesus' death, and we end up denying that Jesus is the way. We end up denying that maybe we even know Jesus, whether that's with our words or our actions or by our inactivity. How often do we just walk away from conversation for fear of what others might think of us? Jesus is the truth because he brought the truth of who God is into the world. He is the self-disclosure of who God is. He narrates God. In fact, he says and does what the Father exclusively tells him to say and do. And so when we come to see Jesus, we come to see the revelation of who the Father is. And the only way for us to see that is through Jesus. And as people come to Jesus, they have life. As they believe in him, they find life. Jesus has just unpacked earlier, I go and prepare a place for you. I will come again and will take you to myself that where I am, you may be also. He's going to go to the cross in the next few hours. He's going to, the, he's going to go to prepare a place for all who believe. And he's going to come back and he's going to bring all of those who believe into that place to be with him where he is for all eternity where we will enjoy perfect peace, perfect joy, and perfect love with the Father forever. But here, in the meantime, in the time between that point and eternity, Jesus says, I am the life. Now let me just try to unpack this. When when we don't rely on the truth of Jesus being the way, we end up following the route of there must be other ways. And so what we end up doing is attempting to make ourselves good enough. We, we pretend that we're good enough or we deny that there's a way. And so whenever you are trying to pretend you're good enough, whenever you are not trusting in the righteousness of God, what we have to do is, is forge a new version of ourselves. We have to try and fake it to be able to be acceptable. So what what happens is we we end up trying to offer all of our goodness to to our God, to to a God who has some scales that we can put our goodness on and see if it balances out in our favor. And and whether we, we trust that or not, end up we realize that we are unworthy of that. So what we have to try to do is because of the slavery and the bondage of, of trying to present this this fake version of ourselves we end up having to daily present this projection that we're sorted. We have to daily present this this idea that we have everything sorted and that we're good enough. And underneath that slavery and that bondage is this undercurrent of, I'll never be good enough. There's a deep-rooted insecurity that, that runs through all of that. And so in the quiet moments of our hearts, If we were ever asked the question, we would be saying, you know what, I'm a fraud. I am completely unworthy. I'm a rubbish parent. I'm a rubbish employee. I I, I sin and struggle with sin. But we don't like presenting that. And so instead, what we do is we present ourselves as sorted. We present ourselves as as good, as strong. We end up trying to open up our strengths and showing them to the world around us. We set up our our Bible on a table with flowers and a coffee and we get our Instagram feed and we filter that through the feed to make it look as though we are sorted. We project our lives as beautiful, joy-filled moments. But yet underneath all of that, comes this life-sucking element because of that insecurity and that fear of, I'm going to get found out. People are going to see me for the fraud that I am. People are going to realize that I am unworthy. And so you become a slave to living out that projection. And we know that to be true because we know science has even shown that the likes of social media where we're presenting only our good selves 
only those things that we've set up. We know that that is bad for our, our hearts and our minds and causes so much pain. But if I believe in the righteousness of Christ, if I believe in his righteousness and not my own righteousness, I have the freedom to embrace my failures, my weaknesses, and to present them to those around us, not for fear of being found out, not for fear of being belittled, but knowing that it is his righteousness that I stand. And so I can tell you all of my failings. I'm not going to do that today. It's too many. But because my righteousness is inadequate to get you home, I do not need to fear that me telling you that I'm not perfect, that I am not always in a great place. I do not need to fear telling you that because I am not your hero. I am not your savior. We have a savior and his name is Jesus and he is the way. He is the truth. He is the life. And so when you know that way, you have rest. Whenever you know that truth, your heart fears the Lord. In Proverbs 19, verse 23, it says, the fear of the Lord leads to life. The truth of knowing who Jesus is leads to life. But more than that, whoever has that, whoever has that, rests satisfied. That is the, that is the life that we long for. That is the, 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 the troubled heart being um, medicated. We, we, we are able to have life in him and be satisfied in it. We're able to sleep and be satisfied. Whilst those who, who project those who project their self-righteousness and pretend and seek to hide their guilt and their shame. The Bible says in Psalm 32, verse 3, For when I kept silent, my bones, they, they wasted away through my groaning all the day long. And we experience that, don't we? When we're projecting, whenever we're struggling each day to, to show ourselves as, as something that we're not, we feel the pain of trying to keep on perpetually living that lie. We find that it is life-sucking, that it destroys us and the physical stress that comes from it as we project and seek to show our self-righteousness and our attempts trying not to be caught out. The good news, friends, is that Jesus frees us from that. That's what he means when he says that I am the way, the truth, and the life. And we need to know that because we have to stop trying to project this, this false, polished version of ourselves and instead trust in the righteousness of Christ. For we have all sinned. Every single one of us has sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. We all, like sheep, have gone astray. As Anna said earlier, we all have a, we're all prone to wander to wander away from God, to wander into the deceitfulness of sin. And often whenever I find myself in that place, often whenever I, I sometimes feel unworthy and I'm trying to project my own self-righteousness, I, I remind myself of these verses. And I remind myself of, of the prodigal son in Luke 15. And if you know the story, you, you'll know it well, but if you don't, let me just paraphrase. The son as a father, the son wants all of his possessions now so as he can go and live his own life. And what, in fact, he says to his father is essentially, I wish you were dead so that I could have everything that I am owed, my inheritance, and so as I can go out and enjoy life to its fullest. And so the father gives this son all of that inheritance that is due to him. And the son goes away to a foreign land and he squanders it all in what the Bible says is reckless living. Think drinking, gambling, women, you name it. He did it all for himself. And we see what happens. He ends up in rock bottom. In fact, worse than that, he ends up in a pigsty in the midst of the, the muck and the mire and the pig excrement, sitting in that pigsty, wondering to himself, that food that the pigs get to eat can I eat that? And in that moment of, 
of the lowest of lows, he comes to his senses and he remembers his father's house. He remembers home. And he remembers that actually the servants in his father's house have a better living than him. They have a better opportunity than him. They're treated better, better than he is. And so he comes to his senses and he makes that journey home. And I love this bit because the father stands there waiting and sees him and is filled with compassion and he runs to him and he embraces him and he kisses him. Now, just imagine that. This guy didn't get cleaned up. He walks from the dirty pig sty all the way home. He is covered in pig excrement. He stinks and he comes to his father, his face covered still with the slop that he had been eating. And his father embraces him. His father kisses him. His father clothes him with a new robe, the best robe. He puts a ring on his finger, puts shoes on his feet, and then he throws the party of all parties. For the son that was lost has now been found. The son that was dead is now alive, and he has come home. And so as you remember that, even if you feel unworthy at times, even whenever you feel like, I have to project because God couldn't accept me. Know that he invites you to come home. Know that he invites you to come home. And so step into the life that he has prepared for you. Step into his righteousness that he has given to you. Let your hearts not be troubled, Jesus says. Believe in me, for I am the life. Let me just close with this. Uh, Everyone loves the first part of verse 6. The first part, that's great. That's for coffee mugs. That's for posters in a house. The second part, people don't like that quite as much. No one comes to the Father except through me. This is an exclusive claim by Jesus. He says, I am the way. I am. There is no other way except through me. And that statement is as timely today as it was way back when Jesus proclaimed it. He doesn't proclaim to be a way or a truth or a life. Instead, he proclaims to be the way, the truth, the life. And in in an age of religious pluralism, and what I mean by that is simply that there's many ways to God. That's the idea. There's many ways to God, whether it's other religions or or whether it's our good works or, or whether it's simply just attending a church. The reality is we need to know that he is the way, but that is considered as being narrow minded and even intolerant. But when souls are at stake, who do you trust? Do you trust society's views on hopefully my goodness will be sufficient? Or you trust the one who declared, I am the way, I am the truth, I am the life, and I will prove it, and I have proved it, by going to die on a cross, taking on all of the darkness of sin and shame, of rising again to life three days later, conquering death, proving beyond, a, a, beyond doubt, and thereby making a way for all those who believe to come into the presence of the Father. Who do you trust? Do you trust the society with its, cha- with its changing views that are constantly changing, generation after generation? Or do you trust the one, the sustainer, the creator of the universe, the great I am the unchangeable one, the one who says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. A number of years ago, I spent some time with a Muslim friend um, seeking to, to help them see who Jesus was. We walked through John's gospel together, and we had a number of weeks where they were able to see the, the beauty of Jesus. They were able to see uh, what he had done. They were able to see what he was inviting them into. They were able to see how amazing and gracious and loving and kind that invite was. And yet, they, they didn't accept that invitation. And as I probed a little bit with them, my heart be- began to break and, and tears ran down my face. 
um, in the middle of that coffee shop as we just talked about what they were putting their hope in. Uh, and ultimately, they wanted to put their hope in their own perceived attempts at righteousness, their own attempts to be good enough. And as we probed a little bit further, they were quick to admit that they knew they were unworthy. They knew that if they put their lives on the scale of being good or, or not, they would fall short. And so my heart broke in that moment. So friends, we need to keep on proclaiming the truth of who Jesus is more and more. We need to go out and broadcast him to the ends of the earth. We need to make sure that people know who he is. But more than that, we need to pray. We need to pray that people's eyes will be able to see that they are in need of Jesus and that they are in need of him as the way, the only way. He's the way to the place that we all long for, the, that restful, all-satisfying presence of the Father. He is the truth that, that brings peace and hope. And he's the life that brings real freedom and joy. He's that exclusive way. But he stands and invites you home. He stands and invites everyone to come home. He's his invitation is inclusive and far-reaching. It's to the ends of the earth. But yet it is exclusive in that he is the only way. There is no other way for anyone to enter into the Father's house. It is only through Jesus. And so how do we respond to this? Well, we have to remember, and we have to remember on a daily basis, that Jesus is the only one that can, can fulfill our deepest longings in life. He is, the, in the very essence, truth and life, and he is the only way of salvation. And I'm just going to repeat what Peter said in Acts 4, because it's straight to the point. There is salvation in no one else, for there is no other name under heaven given among men by which we must be saved. And so if you are aware of that deep longing of your soul, if you've been searching but you haven't yet found or experienced that joy, that, that life, that hope, that assurance that comes through Jesus and Jesus alone, if you don't know him yet, perhaps you thought you knew him, but if you don't know him yet, then listen to his voice. I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. Jesus invites you. More than that, he calls you. More than that, he embraces you and welcomes you home. Today, if you hear his voice, don't harden your heart. Don't run away. Instead, run to him, the way, the truth, and the life. And if you do know Jesus, keep on remembering this truth. This is a truth that we need to remind ourselves of and need to remind others of. Because we're so quick, we're so prone to forget it and to leave the God we love, as we sang earlier. Don't trust in your own self-righteousness. It is never good enough. Don't run away if you're feeling a sense of unworthiness. Come to Jesus, for he is the only way. Trust in him. Live your life to the fullest in light of that truth. And do that today, do that tomorrow, do that into eternity until we're with him where he is. Let me just pray for us. Father God, thank you so much for your self-declaration of who you are. Thank you so much that it is only through Jesus that we can come into your presence. Thank you so much that he is the way that I don't have to seek to earn my, my route into your good books, but instead I can trust in the righteousness of Christ that he imparts onto me and onto us. Lord God, I pray that you will help us to know that truth. I pray that you will help us to declare that truth and broadcast that truth to the world around us, starting with our family and our friends and those in close proximity to us, but reaching out to the ends of the earth. When souls are at stake, help us, Lord, to be bold, to be brave and courageous, 
and to be empowered by your spirit to speak these words of truth, these words of that sin and death exist, that the hell and salvation is and salvation from hell is real. Help us to, to be able to proclaim that Jesus is the way in the eternal presence of the Father. And so, Lord, we pray that you will continue to speak to us uh, from your words, that you will continue to open our minds and our hearts to live in light of this truth, that we may live in the fullness that you have for us. In Jesus' name, amen.